just uh, tuning in. Uh, we've now lost 21 minutes of Pastor Mike online because I didn't hit the record button. Okay, so I got to do this all over again. You know, like in 2001 Space Odyssey, right? Look here. The next human. The next, look at it. The next human. And then here, here we go. Get ready for this one. Taking evolution into our own hands. Cover story. National Geographic magazine. Read by millions of people all over the planet. Especially seventh grade boys. Okay. Anyway, read by people all over the world. Why? Because it is like the liberal manifesto. This is, uh, if you don't believe in evolution, it's because you're an idiot and you should. And so anyway, I bought a copy of this. I got the articles here. I, I did skip over the uh, climate change part. Okay. And then there's the grass-eating monkeys of Ethiopia. And then there is the, uh, the, the, the Taliban in Pakistan. Do do run, run, run. Home on the range. But the article here, uh, let me read you a few samples uh, of, the, um, of the article here. Not climate change. Not Ethiopia. Here we go. Back here. There is this guy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Neil Harbison, who refers to himself as a cyborg living in Barcelona, Spain, España. Um, when he got his, um, let's see, where does it say it at? When he got his passport picture taken, uh, let's see, persuaded the British government to let him wear. When he got his passport take, picture taken by the British government, he convinced them that an antenna sticking out of the top of his head was an extension of his brain and thus should be part of his passport, official passport photo. He prevailed. He won. And when they took his picture with his antenna sticking out of his head, they included it in his passport because it's it's like part of his, he added something to his body. He added it. What did he add? Well, he was born with an, um, an issue where he does not see anything in color. He does, he does not see, he sees everything like a Three Stooges movie, all right? They're all in black and white, Rabbit and Costello, or Laurel and Hardy, or whatever, or the first 20 minutes of uh, Wizard of Oz, all right? He sees everything in black and white, and now he says that he has an advantage over other puny humans because he um, he's not distracted... He said, I'm not distracted by colors. And he said, I memorize shapes a lot easier. And he said, I can see farther than like most humans can. That's what he says. So he decided, he finally found a surgeon whom he keeps anonymous. He finally found a surgeon that would do this for him. He devised an implant whereby he, he put an implant into the top of his brain, into his head that would vibrate it had an optical sensor like i don't know like coming around the side of his head or something like that it has an optical sensor in it like a camera that picks up the colors that he would normally see with his eyes but he doesn't see them with his eyes so this this sensor this camera when it sees colors in the field of view that he's looking at it will vibrate 
his skull or something up here in his head. And his brain picks up those vibrations as frequencies or basically as sound. He has the ability to see colors, or let me say this differently. He hears colors with a quote unquote, this is his reference, a third ear. <laughs> okay? A third ear. He the sensor picks it up. Whatever the main color is that he's looking at, the sensor will vibrate at a frequency for that color. And he can tell you what color something is because he's quote unquote hearing the color in his head. And here's what he said. Um, and, and, and by the way, he, uh, he inserted also another implant a Bluetooth communication hub so friends could send him colors through his smartphone. I'm reading this. He said, the antenna has been a revelation. The world is more exhilarating for him. Over time, he said the input has, here we go, get ready. This is where I need the music, okay? The input has begun to feel neither like sight nor hearing. I want you to get what he just said. He said it doesn't feel like sight and it doesn't feel like hearing. It feels like a sixth sense. It's what it feels like. Now, do you, do you know what that is? And I want you to contemplate numbers because numbers are God's universe. God made numbers. God made patterns and rhythms and cadences and order and everything. And it's all based upon math and principles of math. And God, my good friend now gone to be with the Lord. And Hutch was. Noah Hutchings uh, was a tremendous man, a giant for the Lord. I hate to use the word giant, but that's, I mean, he was a great guy. And he wrote a book called God the Master Mathematician. And he agreed with me. He said, God knows numbers. God knows calculators. And God's everything God does is in order, including his word. And so um, the universe is in numbers. God gave us Five senses. Can you name them? Sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. The five sen- The five ways. It's our BIOS, basic input output system. I don't know if you know this, but at the core of every computer that's ever been turned on before it ever reads the operating system like Windows or Mac or Linux or Solaris or whatever, before it does that, the computer has to, has to have a set of rules on how to communicate outside of the microprocessor. And so when you first turn on a computer, it has to go through a BIOS, a basic input output system. It reads the parameters and, and sets the conditions for how imp information is going to be inputted into the machine and then outputted, output out of it, okay? Your body has a basic input-output system. Your brain is the processor, and you have sight, which inputs into the brain, smell. And by the way, fragrances and smell are they say one of the one of the few um, few senses that we actually remember long term and they can trigger memories and boy can they okay uh, I pass by certain bushes and I smell my grandmother's house because she had the same kind of bushes outside of her house I mean just that's what it brings to mind it's a very pleasant thought and that's I like that smell okay but anyway um, sight, sound, all these systems are inter, we interchanging information into the brain, smell, taste, and touch. All of these sensors, the inputs are going into the brain. The brain processes those inputs, and then the output of those senses are going to be either a movement of our eyes a turning of our head. If we hear something on the left, we turn to the left. If we hear something on the right, we turn to the right. And our, 
God gave us two ears bilaterally so that we could discern what direction a sound comes from. Part of the fight flight scenario that we have. Um, taste. If something goes in our mouth that's really good, we're going to put it in again. Something goes, <laughs> if something goes up your nose really good, you're going to shove it up there again. Okay, somebody sm smelling a flower. Hmm. And what do we do? Smell it again. Smell good. Okay. And then after like 40 times, we're going, I don't smell anything. It's because you got used to it. But anyway, basic input output system. We have five of those that were given to us by our creator. And I want you to get the number on this. Five is a number for grace. Five is a number for death, but it's also life because the rapture is new life. Okay. It's, it's resurrection for us. Um, the number six, man and beast were both created on day six of creation. Remember what God said to Job. He said, remember um, behemoth whom or which I made with thee. What does that mean? On the same day, God created beast from the earth. He created us from the earth and back to the earth we go. Um the number six, all, and when you have the fusion of those two, you have uh, his number is both is the number for a man, it's the number for a beast. 603 score and six. Genesis chapter six is the meaning of that number. It's a number for preparation, but it's also the number for the, the, the confusion of man and beast together. And I want you to ponder that because having a sixth sense. Now, in the old paradigm, the old world, if someone was said to have a sixth sense, like uh, Uri Geller, who was a, uh, a world-famous psychic in the 70s, he was a Jewish-born Israeli citizen psychic, he made his rounds in Europe and American television, bending spoons and doing all this stuff, and a man by the name of James Randi, who was a uh, magician, uh, made TV shows and said, look, I can bend spoons. He bent spoons. And he said, I'm not a psychic. And then he showed everybody how he bent spoons. It was a magic trick. So was he real or not? I don't know. But there are people who say they have a sixth sense. What does that mean? It means that they are receiving channeled information from a non-natural source. I want you to grasp at that. Get it. They're receiving transmitted or channeled information from a non, either a subnatural or a supernatural source. So in essence, this guy who says that he has this communication coming into his brain by way of this, by way they're either the Bluetooth transmitter or the optical sensor that he has, he literally is receiving information from a non-natural source. Now, again, in the old days, it was said that these were coming through, you know, like channeled entities like, you know, the aliens, the Torellians, okay, the Venetians, or I made that up. Uh, the Klingons, okay, or the Ferengis, or anybody else, all right? Uh, that was, that was, or devils, okay? That was, that's the old paradigm, the new paradigm. To me, just as real and just as deadly and unbiblical as the old paradigm, it is the idea that man is altering himself, and in essence, bettering himself. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. Um, let's see here. Ray Kurzweil, they, of course, they got to bring Ray Kurzweil into this. This is the article in um, National Geographic Magazine, The Next Human. Um, it talks about, where does it talk about Ray Kurzweil? Here it is. 
It says, he then is the first step toward the goal that visionary futurists have always had. An early example of what Ray Kurzweil in his well-known book, The Singularity is Near, calls, quote, the vast expansion of human potential. Harbison hadn't particularly meant to jumpstart Kurzweil's dream. His vision of the future is more sylvan than silicon, but which basically means it's more, more natural. Sylvan means like the woods, nature. Silicon is artificial. And I want you to get this. Let me let me ex- let me explain this for a minute. The word artificial. What he's doing is he is receiving his sixth sense by way of an artificial means. All right. I mean, we have this natural means: touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing that m- most humans have. Some do without one or the other. But most humans have these natural senses to receive an artificial one. The word itself being based upon the word artificer. And that word you will find in your King James Version of the Bible. An artificer is one who crafts with his hands... Those who were artificers in brass and iron and gold and silver, they worked in these metals. They were artificers in wood. And they would take a tree and cut it down. Um, If you have not seen Pastor Reg Kelly's A Table in the Wilderness series, he's doing YouTube videos now, okay? And I helped him. I helped him get started, okay? Uh, and he, while we were out uh, doing some practice filming, he literally, we, we helped him, me and my sons, drove down to Norwood, Missouri, helped him drag a picnic table out in the middle of the woods off of his cow pasture, and he sits there in the woods and does these videos. And I'm going, that's cool, it's a good idea, okay? And so we helped him with the, the equipment and everything, showed him how to work it and everything like that, and, and he did, he did great. But then he included me on because I'd mentioned to him he brought up the idea of, of you know, the guys cutting a tree down and cutting an idol out of it. And I said, do you know why the Druids worshipped oak trees? And he said, no. And I said, Manly Hall explains it, and there's some other sources for it. But the idea, and and he said, wait, 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 don't tell me yet. He said, let's turn that thing on. Let's make a deal out of this. So we did. We made a little record. I don't know if he put it up there or not. I haven't seen it. But anyway, um, we were we were talking about this on camera. And and I said, the, um, the Druids worshipped oak trees because they believed that there was a God hidden inside of it. And technically, there was. Technically. But it had every and it had everything to do with how the craftsman would take the trunk of the tree, what the King James Bible refers to as the stock, which means a stick, the stick, a big stick, the trunk of a tree, and the craftsman would take that tree with the with the insight given to him by the supreme deities, the ascended masters. He would envision. He would receive the vision. Downloaded into his mind of what the God on the inside of the tree looked like. It was fed into his imagination. So he would use his imagination and he would take his hammer and his chisel and he would begin to carve out of that tree the God of his imagination. By the time he had shaved off the bark and all the outer parts of the outer rings of the tree, why, sure enough, there was, lo and behold, a God in the middle of that tree, just like the Druid said there would be. Do you get it? But it was a God that was carved out and crafted by the artificer. Those who were crafty, in taking that stock, carving out an idol out of their imagination. I think our God looks like this. 
Oh, I think our God looks like that. I, I think our ancestors look like these images on a totem pole. Am I right? Those of you who are First Nations or Native Americans, your ancestors worshipped dead people that they had no idea who they look like, but they were all carved out of the same tree on a totem pole. Am I right or am I right? It was all... You, you don't know what your great, 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 great grandfather 3,000 years ago looked like. You have no idea. Somebody carved it out out of their imagination. Out of the same tree. So the idea of artificial means that an artificer took it and made it himself with his own hands. And that's, that's, the, that's the article here. Taking evolution into our own hands. Now, number one, numero uno. Prima. There is no evolution. <gasps> oh, no, really, there's not. We, we're not. We there's. We've same same DNA, same DNA that God gave Adam. You and I, according to the Bible, you and I, according to the Bible, were in Adam. You and I, we were sitting in there in his genome. And his, the Bible says his loin. The Bible says that Levi was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to the king of Salem. And the Bible, the Bible says that Levi paid tithes to uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Me, it, Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes to a greater than Levi. And the teaching was that Christ was out of the order of Melchizedek. But anyway, um, there is no zero, none evolution. There has not been a series of accidents that have caused mutations in the genome that have bettered every species on the planet. It doesn't exist. It doesn't work. There is no such thing as stupid, idiotic, theistic evolution, and I'm sorry that that burned you because I use the word stupid and idiotic, idiotic referring apparently to you because you believed in theistic evolution. But I'm not apologizing because the idea of theistic evolution is both stupid and idiotic and willfully ignorant. Willfully ignore. You are ignoring the facts of the word of God that says in the evening and the morning were the first day, in the morning were the second day. Not eons, not eras of time, first day, second day, third day, just like you and I figure days. That's how everything was created in the creation. What was I getting at? Ray Kurzweil, in his book, The Singularity is Near, and you know where he gets the title, right? It's drawn from this old idea of a man standing out on a sidewalk in busy downtown New York City holding up a, a sign saying the end is near. It's like, you know, the these city prophets who are warning everybody as they're passing by, the end is near, Jesus is coming, right? Ray Kurzweil is just telling everybody the singularity is not the end, the singularity. What he means by that is, and my video's flittering, which I know what that means. It means we're going to have to go back and edit this recording. I know what that means. It, aggr it irritates me. Anyway. Um, but that's what he, that's, the singularity is the day at which computers become self-aware. That's what he said. And you know what? Right now, I don't disbelieve him. Not right now, I don't. I mean, if you would have asked me in the 80s, the first time I saw uh, Schwarzenegger starring as the Terminator about a time when computers would be self-aware, I recently posted to Twitter a picture of me and my buddy from Bible College, Craig Shaw, who to this day remains a great friend of mine. Uh, he and I were classmates. And um, I in the background is my... <laughs> Is my Commodore 64 computer with uh, only like 50, what, 58 kilobytes of RAM after they stored basic in five kilobytes of it. 
Um, and then my um, Star Micronics near letter quality dot matrix printer, which cost me a handy 250 bucks. And in 1985, to a college guy, 250 bucks was hard to come by. But I made a dollar a page typing term papers. Okay, that was that was Pete. That was pizza money. That was Little Caesar's pizza money. We could get two of them for one price. But anyway, that was when the Terminator comes out in the '80s, and I'm going. These things don't think by themselves. <laughs> I I could not. I could not see. I could not see. In 1985, I could not see this. I could not see this. I could. I never, never in my mind saw smartphones or tablets or that practically everything now that's being made for the modern 21st century house has a smart device in it that's hooking into electronically with the rest of the entire world and that like some 60 to 70% of all information trafficked on the internet has nothing to do with what you search for at Google and the pictures you looked at. It has more to do with how the stuff in your house is recording everything that goes on in your house. Never, We never saw that back in the 80s. We never saw artificial intelligence, but in science fiction. Now we're seeing it as a reality. Now And now we're living it. I mean, first we watch um, Jeopardy. One of my, it used to be one of my favorite shows. Then we, we watch Jeopardy and the, and, the, and the champions of Jeopardy, top three players who ever played Jeopardy are playing IBM's Watson computer. And Watson is beating them. And then promoted this year to American audiences is the fact that you can now use H&R Block to do your taxes. And you better hurry. You can now use H&R Block to do your taxes. And along with H&R Block, you're going to get Watson. IBM's artificial intelligent computer to help you do your taxes. And no, it's not some geek or weasel sitting in a cubicle that's looking at your tax information going, oh, look at what they spent their money on. I know stuff about them. It's, it's far more advanced and far more sinister. How so? You see, and I talked to a lady today, had a great conversation, and um, she wanted to send me some information, and I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to see it. She said, you know, I, I got to you know, be careful about, you know, what I talk about and, you know, what I transmit and stuff like that because, you know, you know who, Google, they're watching us. And I said, ma'am, can I, get, can I help you out with that? And she said, yeah. I said, I don't hide what I do on the internet, I don't hide it. I don't, I don't hide my IP address. I don't. I use Google as a browser. I Chrome. I, I search. I Google stuff all the like you do. And I, if if I, I'm not afraid that some government spy in a cubicle is spying on me. I'm. I don't care. Or that I'm going to say something and pass my online or whatever, and some agency is going to start flying black helicopters around our top seat. They'll never find us to begin with. I'm not, I'm not scared about that. Jesus told us that what he said to us that we're to proclaim from the housetops. We're not, I'm not going into hiding. And, but here's the thing. I'm not concerned about somebody in a cubicle somewhere at the NSA or CIA or wherever, finding out what I'm doing online. 
because you have to ask the question, how many agents of the CIA and the NSA combined are there? Let's say, let's say that there's 500,000. I have no idea, but let's say 500,000. That's a million. Let's say a million. Let's say there are one million combined agents sitting at computer terminals in the CIA, NSA complexes that are, um, their job is to analyze big data from the internet, from the American internet. How many people in America are online today? You have people age 80 on down to five years old that are online and sending a constant stream of big data nonstop 24 hours a day. You're talking about in excess of an easy estimate is 100 million people. There are 300 million people in America right now. I'm just saying one third of them. And it's probably got to be two thirds. 150 million. 150 million non stop sources of data for one million people to go through. That means for every agent, I made the number up, but for every agent, 150 people that they have to look at all their data 24 hours a day, seven days a week in order for them to get a grasp on who's dangerous. Not possible. Not possible. Not possible with human beings. Possible with artificial intelligence systems. So we're, I'm, we should not be concerned about one person in the NSA, who we are afraid is going to find out that you were looking at pictures of Jennifer Lopez. You should not be concerned about that. You should be concerned about your wife finding that out. You should not be concerned about the NSA finding that out. You should be concerned about the artificial intelligent monster that is being created right now that has a capacity far greater than any mortal man to analyze you and know you better than you know yourself. And I'm not talking about their ability to do this five years from now. I'm talking about their ability to do it right this minute. There is a bill. I don't know if it was passed. I read about it last week. I knew that it was going to end up on President Trump's desk, and I heard that he was going to, in fact, sign it. It was a bill that was going to loose the restrictions. Imagine that. It was going to loose the restrictions placed upon telecom or telecommunication companies. Right now, Google, Google Facebook, Yahoo, all of those companies, they have access to all Every single bit of your personal browsing history and information. They have access to every bit of it, and they have the right to store it and to analyze it and to sell it to the highest bidder. They have the absolute, you, you agreed to it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Before you installed Google Chrome as your browser, you hit a term of service agreement. I accept the terms because if you don't, they don't let you install the software. You agreed to it and you gave Google the absolute right to record every square bit of data that you receive and transmit. The telecommunication companies, AT&T, Sprint, um, what are the other companies? Verizon. They've had their hands tied. There is a law that said that they cannot gather information and store it and sell it on how you used your cell phone. That law now is going to be gone. And they're going to untie for AT&T, Sprint, Verizon. What are these other companies? Orange in Kenya. 
They're going to untie their hands so that they can now start gathering, compiling, saving, and then selling to the highest bidder everything you do on your cellular device. And buddy, let me tell you something. This little this little beastie here does far more collection on you than your home computer does. Do you know why? Because your home computer, let, let me hear you say it. It's where? It's at home. This goes... <laughs> This goes to the bathroom with you. Right? No, I don't. I didn't mean that it goes to the bathroom. I did. You know what I mean. You take it into the bathroom with you. You you say stuff on your phone, either voice or text or email, that we used to only write in little love notes to our girlfriends or wives we now text it and now they're going to keep it and they're going to sell it they're, so they can advertise you so like they're going to know sweetie pie day is every friday and, and we go here and we go here and we go here and we go there so they're going to sell advertisement to us based upon what we do every single day You know what that is? Smartwatch. Okay? Now, I take it off at night, put it back on in the morning. It's got to charge. Some people put their Fitbits on or their smartwatches and leave them on. And these, <laughs> are you kidding me? These things are recording my pulse. And my body temperature, my heart rate. How many times? There's an app on here. It's the stupidest one. I hate it. You know what it does? You know what it does three times a day? I have an app on here that says it'll vibrate. And I'll look at it because I think I got a text message from Sweetie Pie. And I'll look at it and go, this is your reminder to breathe. And I'm going, what am I, blonde? I've been breathing all day. I don't need the watch. And I know what it is. It's like this guided meditation thing. We're wanting you to breathe. I ignore it. I don't know if I don't know if I can get it off here. It came with the watch. Now, there's a difference between this. My goodness. It is 88 degrees. In Juazero de Norte. I have no idea where that is. That's just what came up on there. They're not that smart. I can tell you that. Okay. There's a difference between this. Above. The wall. That God made for my body. And the day when this breaches the wall into my body there's a difference that diff this is what this um I'm, I almost showed you the perina ad on the back this is what this is all about it's about breaching that wall this is what this is about let me read you some quotes, and um, I'll be honest with you. And I, I feel bad, but I'm running out of gas, okay? Genetically, this is, um, believe it or not, this is some notes that I saved in Evernote, 1st of January, or excuse me, the 19th of January, 2015, over two years ago. This was an article at uh, GrahamHancock.com. Here's some of the, the uh, things that he collected. Genetically engineering ethical babies is a moral obligation, says an Oxford professor. Genetically screening our offspring to make them better people is just responsible parenting, claims an eminent Oxford academic. 
by screening and by screening in and screening out certain genes. And you know what that means. Screening in and screening out, that means adding to and taking away. This is what the guy who didn't like my rapture series, this is what the guy accused me of. He accused me of adding to the word of God, and I never did. I, I had, In this ministry, I can't say what I did 20 years ago. I did some stupid stuff 20 years ago. I have not added to the word of God in this ministry. I've not. But this is what he accused me of. But screening in and screening out certain genes in the embryos, it should be possible to influence how our child turns out. If we have the power to intervene in the nature of our offspring, rather than consigning them to the natu- natural lottery, then we should. Whether we like it or not, the future of humanity is in our hands now. Are you, are you catching this? It's in our hands now. Who's Okay, here's my question. Big academic Oxford genius. Whose hands was it? Before we got it. Say it. Say it. God. His hands. He made this temple. He made it with his word. And God. I'll I'll quote scripture here. Let me finish reading what he said. Whether we like it or not, the future of humanity is in our hands now. Rather than fearing genetics, we should embrace it. Oh, I love you, genetics. I love you. We can do better than chance. Whether we like it or not, the future of humanity is in our hands now. Let's... uh, Let's read this book here just for a minute. Okay? And then I'm going to go lay down. I just, to be honest with you, I don't care how bad I feel. I feel like, I feel like I'm cutting, I'm doing, I know, I, I appreciate everything everybody has told me. Pastor, we love you. Man, we appreciate what you're saying. Okay, take your time, get your body healed. I appreciate that. I just feel like I feel worthless and useless, and I don't like feeling that way. If I can at least get in here and do something for the kingdom, okay? That's who I'm doing it for. Genesis, Genesis. I know better than that, okay? Genesis 1, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Why? Because all God has to do is say it and it's done. Listen, if man is going to try to play God, he stinks at it. He's not, he's not good at it. God did not go. All right. Let's try to make giraffes. And they started out with a neck this long. And then they were got like, they couldn't reach the trees. They couldn't eat. He's starving to death. He's going, oh, why did, I'm going to have to make them like with longer necks. Okay, let's try this again. Let's make giraffes and the neck. God did not trial and error his creation. You ever considered that one? He didn't, he didn't like, all right. Take 497, cre- creating the duck-billed platypus. And if you don't know what that is, you look it up. It's like the biggest anomaly on planet Earth, duck-billed, duck-billed platypus. Is it a fish? Is it an animal, a mammal? Is it a reptile? Is it, what is, nobody, it, is, is it a bird? Nobody knows what, they don't know how to char- characterize it. Okay. It's, it lives like a mammal, but it reproduces like a reptile. It lays eggs. And then they, they're going, all right, duckbill platypus, take number 500. 
Okay, I'll get it right this time. Leave, leave, no, leave the bill on. We'll leave the bill on. We'll try that. God did not trial and error. Scientists are working in these labs, and 99% of the things that they do fail. I'll wait for it. Fail miserably. That's how bad they fail. And then they get that one thing right, and they're going, look at, look at what we did. We did that one thing right. We should get a Nobel Prize. Okay? They pat themselves on the back for trial and error, and God just said it one time. <clears throat> Perfect. Exactly how he wanted it. And exactly the end. Listen, how many, um, how many living organisms are there on this planet? And I'm not just talking about the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom too. Onions and pears and, you know, all that stuff. How many living organisms organisms are there on this planet? And how are they balanced out so that every species has something to eat from all of the other species? Man can't do, man, man stinks at doing that. God did it in six days. He got it right every day time without failure in six days man's going to play God all right and he's going to stink at it God said let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind cattle and creeping thing beast of the earth after his kind and it was so God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and God saw this good now, if you want to contrast something, contrast the, the rhythm, the pattern, the cadence of day six of creation versus day four of creation. In day four of creation, God speaks in fours. In day six of creation, he speaks in le trois. Why? Because this number represents the spiritual realm or the heavenly realm. Vis-a-vis four dimensions. This number represents, and for those of you listening to the MP3, I'm holding up three fingers. Le toi, okay? This number speaks of three dimensions. Thus, the earth. Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. So we have cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, cattle after their kind, and every form of Everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and God saw that it was good. Things of this earth, three. Things of the heavenly realm, four. And God's, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Let me read something out of this wacky magazine. Where, where did it go? Where did, where did I talk? Here it is. Let me, let me read. Of course, this is National Geographic, right? They've got to be Isis worshipers, which means they worship Gaia, the earth goddess. Because one of the issues brought up in this, naturally so, because they have an article in here about climate change and how, oh, it's, we're changing the climate. Seven, seven facts on climate change. You need to know. You need to know these things. Okay? Which bunch of hooey. Um, where was it? Where was it? Ah! Nope. Ain't it. Nope. Ain't it. It was in here somewhere. The idea that man needs to adapt himself to the earth instead of man adapting the earth to himself. Which basically puts the earth in dominion over the man and not vice versa. 
Okay? That's what that that's what that part of this is all about. We in in changing ourselves, we become more earth friendly. And it's basically the old idea that the earth is the woman and she doesn't like the man's feet on her having dominion over her. God gave man dominion over all of the earth, which means if we want to eat fish, buy a cracky, we go to Captain D's and eat fish. And if we want to eat chickens and hamburger animals, and if we want to eat deer and rabbits and turkeys and squirrels and possums and raccoons out of the out of the woods and shoot them dead and skin them and eat their flesh, we have the right to. And I've been written by Europeans going, how do you call yourself a Christian and go out and hunt those little animals? And I'm going, do you not eat meat? Yeah, that's different. I'll keep reading. And then I'm going to go lay down. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle. That's subtle is for people who say herb or herb. Subtle. And think about it. What does the word subtle mean? Whoever put the letter B in the word subtle should get a prize. Okay? Just saying. The serpent was... <laughs> Why? Because it's there, but you'd never know it, would you? That's, that's subtle. Okay? Anyway, and it's like the guy who put the letter S in the, <laughs> in the word lisp. <laughs> Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. See, let's doubt the word of God. Let's just say God didn't write it. God didn't say it. Because in the original Greek, in the original Hebrew, he didn't. He didn't say what's in the Bible. He said he said it in Greek and Hebrew. It's better in the Greek and Hebrew. He said unto them, unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit. Now the woman represents humanity, represents the soul of man, represents churches. Think about it. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God did not say, Thou shalt not toucheth itth. He did not say that. That was that was added by the woman. But God did not say that. And let me just surely anybody who listens to me knows that there is and I always make a difference between what the Word of God says, and my comments on the Word of God. There is always a difference. Always. It's just like, I don't know if you're aware of this. This was, this was instituted in the 70s, in my day. When I get up Saturday morning and watch the cartoons, and after every cartoon on that came on ABC, CBS, NBC, there would be this... After these messages, kids, we'll be right back. Because there was some educated liberal from Harvard who testified before Congress and said, children are not able to discern between the cartoons they're watching and the commercials. Therefore, on Saturday morning programming, it should be, it should be a law that's noted that children need to be informed that there's a difference between the commercials and the program and so that's why they put it on there and if you if you're a child of the 70s or the 80s or the 90s until everybody got cable or satellite and then cartoons are on 24 hours a day instead of just saturday like they normally should be 
Okay. Um, you remember that. That's why they, those were on there. There was a law that said there had to be an announcement. Children, we're going to try to sell your mom and dad a bunch of junk that you're going to beg them for. That's America right there for you. Anyway, there is a difference between the Word of God and my comments on the Word of God. And anybody who listens to me should know the, should know the difference. In the days of Ezra the scribe, Ezra stood up behind a pulpit of wood and he read the word of God plainly to them and then gave the people the sense and the meaning of it, explained it to them. And that's what I'm attempting to do. Don't, you'll just, you'll make me, I'll just, I don't want to talk to you anymore. If you just want to, all you want to do in order to make yourself right is accuse me of adding to the word of God. I don't like that. Anyway, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, because I'm going to raise up Ray Kurzweil. Now see, that is me giving comment to the Word of God. Everybody knows that if you read your Bible, you know that what I just said after, You shall not eat, lest you die. You, everybody knows you shall not surely die, that what I said after that is my humorous tongue firmly planted in my cheek parody on the devil. I didn't add to the word of God. Anybody with a brain knows that. But it was pretty humorous, wasn't it? And no, I operate without a script. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Here is the mystery religion of mankind. Every mystery religion is right here. Because Lucifer, the serpent, can I can I not call the serpent Lucifer and, and say that's the word of God? For every mystery religion that the serpent has woven into the fabric of history is about a secret doctrine that God has not transmitted to mankind. There's a fable, a myth that teaches this idea. It's called, what is it called? I was hoping to think of it as soon as I said it. Prometheus. Prometheus saw up in the heavens that the gods had fire. And all of the poor earthlings were eating their food raw. And Prometheus said, if man had fire, man would invent the microwave and the TV dinner. So Prometheus steals fire from the gods and brings it down to mankind and gives mankind fire. Now the gods are angry. How dare you give mankind fire? And so they issued some sort of decree. I can't remember what they did to poor Prometheus, but he's like doomed and banished for all of eternity. Why? Because the gods had all the power and they didn't want to share it with little puny men. Men didn't even know about fire. And Prometheus brought it down to them. Do you see? Do you see the analogy here? The same thing here is the serpent who's telling Eve Eve God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof ye shall be as God. right? I mean, that's how familiar spirits talk, right? In whispers, that's what the Bible says. Knowing good and evil. 46 words in your King James. You look it up, count them. 46 words in Genesis 11 starts with go to, let us. 46 words. What is the 21st century Tower of Babel? It is the ascendancy of man into heaven by the work of his own hands. And I have 
You guys sent me articles. Cyborgs at work. Super SEALs. Elite units pursue brain-stimulating technologies. Boeing reveals deep space getaway. See, I would like to do that. I would like to be, like, circling the moon. Anyway. Genetically engineering human beings. I mean, I'm going to get to this stuff hopefully by Thursday. But that's that's where... Listen, we're not... I, we are not now any longer talking about what's going to happen in the future. We're talking about what's happening right now. The gods are coming. And the gods are not coming from spaceships falling down to the earth. The gods are mowing the grass next door because your neighbor is going to augment himself. Now, I'm going to close with this. I, you, if you've heard me talk in the last six, eight months, I've mentioned this concerning genetic alteration and all of the things that are coming at us, okay? Okay. And, and let me just say, okay, I made this comment about my watch going onto the inside of me. If no, if you ha- my dad died with a pacemaker. That's not, he didn't turn himself over to the beast, okay? There are insulin pumps, pacemakers, things that help our, some people have mechanical uh, valves. My father in law, our deacon in this church, That silver-haired old man that sits near the front of every service that we ever have who is the stability and what wisdom of our church has mechanical valves in his heart. Not pig valves, mechanical ones. That is not the singularity. The singularity comes when this doesn't just get under our skin. It gets under our skin in a specific spot. And then turns our brain into the World Wide Web. That's where it's going. But I've mentioned about the emotional effect of decision making. In that we make decisions based upon our emotions. Oftentimes more so than our logic. Now I'm going to just tell you what I thought. Was it yesterday or this morning? It was one of the two. Because I'm, I am in sometimes excruciating pain. And I thought, coming into work, so what if I get offered a genetic fix for what's going on in my body? What if I get offered a genetic fix? Pain makes decisions, doesn't it? Those of you who suffer with pain, you know exa- you know exactly what I'm talking about. Pain will make decisions for us. How does the CIA get people to tell secrets that they don't want to tell? Pain. And I had to ask the question. I, I and I I did. I can. I found myself realistically considering, what if they offered me a genetic cure? And I, what I mean by that is, an alteration of my genome, adding to or taking away from my genetic structure that would cure me of all of my pain from here till eternity. Because I'm telling you, the pain I was in yesterday was making me make decisions about not preaching Brother Carmichael's funeral. That my logical mind said, Mike, you have to do this. And my pain said, you're not doing it. You can't. So I'm not just floating of a way above everybody going thou shalt not change your genetics i won't 
because I thought about it. What if, Mike? What if? And I will tell you, but by the grace of Almighty God, I am what I am and will be what I will be. Not by my own willpower. It'll be by God's grace and nada else. Okay? Thank you for letting me bow out early today. I love you. Watchman video broadcast already at Sermon Audio. The YouTube version will be uh, out to this evening. And uh, those of you on our watchers list, thank you for long suffering with us. It's, it's been hard. I haven't felt like doing anything. We're, we're just now getting everything copied. So, and we didn't have all the discs made. So, we'll get it out there. All right. We love you. You're the reason why. You're the reason why. I wanted to come here today and do what I did today. You're the reason. You're the only reason. And the Lord. You guys and the Lord, I love you guys. We'll see you.